say I have a point charge here, it will experience a force in this direction. So it will get an acceleration in this direction. So it will immediately abandon that field line. And so if now you ask me what is the trajectory of that charge, well, it could become very complicated. I really don't know. Maybe it's going like this. And by the time it reaches this point, what I do know that then the force will be tangential to this field line, so it will be in this direction. And so as it marches out and picks up speed, locally it will experience forces representative of those field lines, and so the trajectory can be rather complicated. So field lines are not trajectories, and not even when you release a charge with, uh, with zero speed, only in case that the field lines are straight lines. Let's now look at a field configuration which Maxwell himself, the great maestro, in some of his publications put there. It was a ratio one to four. And whether it is plus four, plus one, or minus four, minus one is not important because that's just a matter of the direction of the arrows. But uh, Maxwell didn't put arrows in. So I leave it up to you. If it's plus four and plus one, you have to put arrows going outwards. And what you see now here is this air blower effect. Think of them as both being positive. So there is the plus four trying to blow air out like a hairdryer, and the plus one is trying to do its own thing, and so you get a field configuration, field lines, which are sort of, not perhaps easy, but you can sort of imagine why it has this peculiar shape. If you um, put a plus test charge in between the one and the four, then the four will repel it, but the one will also repel it. And so there's going to be a point somewhere, probably close to one, whereby the two forces exactly cancel out. Therefore, E will be zero there. In a similar way, between the moon and the earth, there is a point not too far away from the moon where the gravitational attraction from the earth and the gravitational attraction from the moon exactly cancel each other out. That's not too dissimilar from this situation. So when you have charges of the same polarity, you always find in between somewhere a point where the electric field is zero. Let's now go to a very special case whereby I make the two charges equal in magnitude but opposite in sign, and we have a name for that. We call that a dipole. Plus charge is here and the minus charge is there. Situation is extremely symmetric, as you would expect, because they have equal power. There's one air blower upstairs and one vacuum cleaner downstairs. If you're close to the plus charge, notice that all the field lines go away from the plus. And if you're close to the minus, notice that all the field lines come in on the minus. You expect that. If you are far away, from this dipole, now you have a problem. Before we had a plus three and a minus one, and when you're far away, the plus three wins. So it's like having a plus two charge. If you're far away, you always expect the electric field then to be pointing away from the equivalent charge of plus two. But if you add up plus and minus and they have equal magnitude, let's say plus one and minus one, you get zero. So neither one wins if you're far away. And notice carefully, if you're very far away, indeed you do not see arrows either pointing out nor pointing in. Nature cannot decide. There isn't one that is stronger than the other. And that makes dipole fields very, very special. In the case of the plus three and the minus one, if you're very far away, it's like having a plus two charge and the E field, when you go further and further out, will fall off as one over r squared. With a dipole, your intuition sort of tells you that it will probably fall off faster than one over r squared. And that is part of a homework assignment that you have this week. In fact, I can already give you the answer. You have to prove it. If you're far away from an electric dipole, the electric field falls off as one over r cubed. It goes faster than one over r squared. There is not a single point in space 
where the electric field is zero. And you can think about that, why that is the case. So these field configurations can be rather complicated and can be very interesting, and each one has its own applications. Are dipoles rare in physics? Not at all. In fact, they are extremely common. You cannot avoid them. Remember last time I told you if you have a spherical atom or you have a spherical molecule and you bring that close to a charge, let's now think of it, you bring it in an electric field. It's another way of saying the same thing. So we have a nice spherical atom or a nice spherical molecule and we bring it in an electric field. The electrons wants to go upstream the electric field vectors. They go against the direction of the electric field. And the positive charge wants to go in the direction, wants to go downstream. And so, what are you going to do? The electrons will spend a little bit more time on one side of the nucleus than they would in the absence of that electric field. And therefore, you are, through induction, turning that atom, turning that molecule, in becoming a dipole. If you have a little bit more charge on this side, averaged over time, you have the same amount of extra charge plus on that side, averaged over time. So you make dipoles very often, whether you like it or not. And later in this course, we will learn more about the polarization of atoms and molecules creating dipoles when, when we talk about dielectrics. And you will see that it will have an, can have an enormous impact on the properties of the material. Could I make you a dipole here in class? Oh yeah, that's very easy. To make one of non-conductors is not so easy in class. To make one of conductors is very easy. And I'm going to do that with these two spheres that you have. Look at these two metal spheres. Conductors, free electrons, it's very easy for them to move. And I'm going to bring this rubber rod, which I will rub and becomes, I think, negatively charged, if I remember correctly, and I will bring that, say, close to these two, which are touching each other. So here is this one metal sphere, and here's the other metal sphere, and here comes the rubber, negatively charged. Ah, what's going to happen? The electrons want to go away, so this becomes negatively charged, and therefore this remains a little bit positively charged. For every one electron that has, is excess here, when I start it's neutral, there will be a positive excess there because charge is conserved. You can't create charge out of nothing. And now what I do, while this rubber is still here, while that rubber rod is there, I separate them. So here they are, they are in contact with each other first. They have to be in contact. Wow, we get some visitors. I'm impressed. Thank you. Um, so what I do now is, while this rubber rod is still in place, I take them apart. And when I take them apart, this negative charge is trapped and this positive charge is trapped. And so I have thereby created negative charge on this one, positive on this one, and it's equal in magnitude, so I have a dipole. What I want to demonstrate to you is that indeed I have positive charge here and negative here, that there is a difference in polarity between these two. And that's the way that I will do the experiment. I will not show you that the amount of charge is exactly the same on each, which of course it has to be. So let me give you some better light, or we have to get the uh, view graph off, the overhead. You see there for the first time in electroscope, we discussed it last time, it is a piece of aluminum foil, very thin, with a metal rod next to it, and when I put charge on the rod, it will also go onto the aluminum foil, and they will repel each other, and so the, the aluminum tinsel will go to the right. And the more charge there is on it, the farther it goes to the right. So let me first put these two together, make sure they are completely discharged, and now I'm going to bring 